The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everybody to today's hearing on a free press and protecting journalists. I'll remind everybody that the guests in the chamber are uh, guests and you're free to be here, but this is uh, no audience participation in the hearing. Uh, this is a hearing and we're gonna conduct it accordingly. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Our liberty depends on the freedom of the press and that cannot be limited without being lost. Those words were true when Thomas Jefferson wrote them in 1786 and they are still true today. The First Amendment to the Constitution guarantees <coughs> freedom of the press and prohibits the federal government from making any law abridging that freedom. In his concurrence in the New York Times versus the United States, Justice Hugo Black stated, in the First Amendment, the Founding Fathers gave the free press the protection it must have to fulfill its essential role in our democracy. The press was to serve the governed, not the governors. The framers of the Constitution hailed the freedom of the press as the most important political liberty and the keystone upon which all our other freedoms rely. As is still the case today, journalists are often the first to expose government abuse waste, fraud, and encroachments on the personal freedoms we hold dear. Sadly, the freedom of the press is under attack in our country from multiple angles, the White House, activist judges, and mainstream media networks. For example, the Obama White House illegally spied on investigative journalist Cheryl Atkinson by allegedly hacking into her cell phone and computer to determine the identity of a confidential source. We also saw the Obama administration take an adversarial position regarding freedom of the press when it sought to silence anyone blowing the whistle on the federal government's waste and abuse by seizing the phone records of Associated Press reporters and editors who used source materials to write stories. The phone records seized were not just those owned by the Associated Press, but also personal home and cell phones. The seizure of these records was such an alarming step by the federal government that a coalition of 50 news organizations, including ABC, CNN, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, submitted a letter of protest to then Attorney General Eric Holder about the raid, which stated that the administration's action called into question the very integrity of the Department of Justice policies toward the press and its ability to balance on its own its police powers against the First Amendment rights of the news media and the public's interest in reporting on all manner of conduct. The Obama administration's war on a free press showed us that executive interference has a chilling effect that disincentivizes whistleblowers and sources from co coming forward with critical information. That chilling and eventually freezing out effect harms the quality and integrity of journalism on a major scale. Meanwhile, we have seen the Biden Garland Justice Department arrest and prosecute journalist Steve Baker, who was reporting from the US Capitol building on January 6th on the events that took place inside the Capitol. We also recently saw a federal court order, investigative journalist Catherine Herridge to identify a confidential source and then hold her in contempt when she exercised her First Amendment right to maintain the source's confidentiality. First Amendment advocates on both sides of the aisle have warned that government actions such as this could have devastating consequences for a free press. Around that same time, CBS News terminated Ms. Herridge's employment and took unprecedented actions with regards to her belongings, including source materials. CBS News officials reportedly boxed up and seized some of the materials in her office, including her investigative files and laptop computer, with the intent to search through items to segregate materials Ms. Herridge developed or worked on for CBS News. CBS News planned search through Ms. Herridge's materials threatened to trample upon her First Amendment rights and could have divulged confidential sources stemming from her previous work with other networks. Along those same lines, we have also seen the federal government seek to impermissibly shape news stories, even coercing social media companies to censor and remove content on their platforms relating to foreign influence peddling by the president and his family. Today's hearing is about defending our fundamental liberty and protecting journalists and their sources from these attacks. We will examine the federal government's infringement on the freedom of the press and examine the prospects for a federal shield law. On July 19th, 2023, the House Committee on the Judiciary with a vote of 23 to zero, that doesn't often happen in the House Judiciary Committee, 23 to zero, favorably reported on the Protect Reports from Exploita Exploitative State Spying or Press Act. In January of this year, the full House passed the Press Act by a voice vote. 
The Press Act was written to prohibit the federal government from compelling journalists to identify a source, as well as any records, contents of a communication, documents, or information obtained or created by journalists in the course of their work. The significance of the Press Act cannot be understated. It ensures a free press, independent from an executive branch that seeks to attack or harass journalists in order to identify their confidential sources. Now that the House has done its job and stood up to fight for the freedom of the press, it is now the Senate's turn to take up this legislation to continue Congress's commitment to protecting our fundamental freedoms. Our constitu constitutional guarantee of a free press is under attack. It is our job to stand up for that right and protect journalists and their sources. I look forward to hearing from all of our distinguished witnesses today who will all bring unique personal and professional perspectives to this important issue. Please note that a joint schedule of Congress is scheduled for 11 o'clock a.m. and the committee will recess for the duration of that session and gavel back in shortly after. I now yield to the ranking member for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The necessity for and guarantee of a free press is one of the fundamental pillars of our democratic republic, predating and inspiring both our Constitution and the First Amendment. We all know that a democracy only truly works when its citizens are properly informed. And a free press contributes to this goal by ensuring truth and accountability from those in power. A free press informs the American people of important policy issues and government actions that may impact their lives and crucially can reveal incompetence, corruption, deceit, fraud, or bad faith by political candidates and government officials. Thus, attempts by government actors and would-be leaders to undermine the press, whether by promoting conspiracy theories and lies, attacking members of the press with whom they disagree, or undermining the press's ability to obtain vital information are an assault on the pillars of our democratic foundation. One particularly pernicious way this occurs is when the government seeks to compel journalists to disclose the identity of confidential sources. And I think it's important at the outset here to talk about the different ways where the government can compel. It's one thing for the government to seek access to, uh, to confidential sources. It's another when a court is enforcing the law that is written because Congress hasn't acted to create a shield law. So confidential sources provide crucial information to reporters that helps them to share full and impactful stories with the public and government attempts to undermine the confidentiality of those sources erodes the press's ability to perform that function. If the press cannot protect its sources, then important truths may never come to light, and Americans in our democracy suffer. Unfortunately, under both Republican and Democratic administrations, going back decades, we've seen the government in attempts to crack down on leaks, seize phone and email records from journalists, or seek to compel them to reveal the identities of their sources. For example, the Trump administration's Department of Justice seized phone records from three Washington Post reporters and tried to obtain their emails in an attempt to identify confidential sources. The Trump DOJ similarly attempted to obtain these types of records from reporters at CNN and the New York Times. And that's, of course, on top of that administration's other troubling threats to press freedom, such as tracking, detaining, and interrogating journalists reporting on conditions at the U.S.-Mexico border. In response to these and other instances, the House, four times since 2007, passed with overwhelming bipartisan support a federal reporter's shield law. That's legislation to protect journalists and prevent the government from compelling them to reveal their confidential sources with certain exceptions. In fact, former Vice President Mike Pence, then a member of this committee, first introduced such legislation in 2005. More recently, Representatives Kevin Kiley and Jamie Raskin helped spearhead passage of H.R. 4250, the Protect Reporters from Exploitative State Spying Act, or Press Act. And as mentioned, that bill passed the House this past January unanimously by voice vote under suspension of the rules. And that is, as the chairman noted after this committee had reported it favorably by a bipartisan 23 to 0 vote. The Press Act would, among other things, create a qualified federal statutory privilege that protects journalists from being compelled by a federal entity to reveal confidential sources and information. 
The bill also protects third-party service providers, such as telecommunications carriers and interactive computer services from being compelled by the government to reveal information on a journalist's account or device. Unfortunately, despite the House repeatedly and with strong bipartisan support passing some form of federal reporter shield legislation, the Senate has yet to act. Today's hearing should be an opportunity to spur the Senate to action. We're concerned that our Republican colleagues appear to have squandered that chance at a substantive hearing and instead are trying to crank up some right-wing conspiracy theories. But make no mistake, we intend to move forward and try to promote both the Press Act and our constitutional protections. There is, of course, little evidence of ideological bias at CBS News, as, as has been suggested. And even if those allegations were true, Congress would risk exceeding its constitutional authority by intervening. Private news organizations, whether CBS, MSNBC, or Fox, speak through their journalist employees. If Congress tried to punish or shape news coverage, either directly through legislation or indirectly through a pressure campaign, it would run afoul of the spirit, if not the letter, of the First Amendment and potentially violate the news organization's free speech rights and its right to editorial control over its own content. So uh, today, we hope to inquire further from our witnesses about the importance of a Federal Shield Act and why it is long past time for uh, Congress to enact it. Our democracy is already under assault on numerous fronts and we should not be adding fuel to the fire. So let's focus instead on something that would actually protect press freedom, would be completely within our Article I authority and duties, and uh, let's talk about the critical need for a federal reporter's shield legislation. I thank our witnesses for being here, and I yield back. Committee will be in order. I thank the ranking member, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Scanlon, for her opening statement. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. I thank the chairman. It's not just the press that's under attack. Every single liberty we enjoy under the First Amendment has been assaulted in the last couple years. I mean, you think about it. Your right to practice your faith, your right to assemble, your right to petition the government, free press, free speech, every right we enjoy. Americans were, a couple years ago, Americans were told they couldn't go to church on Sunday. Think about that. Two and a half years ago, I spoke to the New Mexico Republican Party in Amarillo, Texas, because they had to go to Texas to get the freedom to assemble because they couldn't do it in their own darn state where they pay taxes because their governor wouldn't let them. You're right to petition the government. You want to petition your member of Congress. You couldn't do it in Congress because the speaker wouldn't let you in. Your own darn capital that you pay for. But the most important two are free press and free speech. We're going to hear about the press today and what's happened to two of our witnesses. How, how, how freedom of the press, while they went after Ms. Atkinson, what happened to Ms. Herridge, uh, this is scary. And then just a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I went to the argument, and this, is, this should frighten us all, I went to the argument in front of the Supreme Court. We had a justice on the United States Supreme Court, this is the big censorship case, it's something this committee spent a lot of time on, where big government pressures, big tech, and big academia to censor speech, not just conservative speech, all speech. That's frightening. And we went to the argument in front of the Supreme Court, and one of the justices said to the Solicitor General from Louisiana, Counselor, your position has the First Amendment hamstringing the government. That's exactly what it's supposed to do, for goodness sake. So this is about the First Amendment. And a free press is essential to having a robust First Amendment and free debate in our culture. And if you don't have free debate, if you can't settle your disputes by arguing and debating, the alternative is frightening. So there is no more important hearing than this. And I want to thank our chairman, and I really want to thank our four witnesses for being here. This is of critical importance. And you know what? This is why we got to pass the Press Shield Act. The House has got it. Let's hope the Senate and the White House can figure this out. We passed this so we don't have this stuff happening to Ms. Herridge. It's happening right now. Where you, we actually had a situation in this committee room. So we got some members of this committee who were there that day where my colleagues on the other side, we had Matt Taibbi on the witness stand and we had colleagues on the other side pressuring him to divulge his sources in a hearing in Congress. We're gonna, I, I don't know, I, to me that's scary as well. 
So this is, this is a critically important hearing with some great witnesses. I look forward to hearing their testimony and the questions that follow. And with that, I yield back. I thank the chairman. I'll now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, over the course of the last two decades, repeated overzealous prosecution of leaks to the press have made it clear that Congress needs to enact a federal reporter's shield law. Congress must protect journalists from being compelled to reveal their confidential sources in order to ensure the free flow of information in matters related to the public interest. During the 117th Congress, when I was chairman of the committee, we came together in a bipartisan vote to pass the Press Act, which would protect journalists and their confidential sources from compelled disclosure, except in certain rare circumstances. It later passed the House in similar bipartisan fashion. Unfortunately, the Senate did not act on the bill. I was pleased, however, when the committee, under Chairman Jordan's leadership, built on this strong action and moved the Press Act once again in this Congress in a, in a unanimous vote of 23 to nothing. It again passed the House by voice vote. I think even a casual observer of the 118th Congress understands just how rare it is for me, Chairman Jordan, and practically the entire House all to agree on the need for the same piece of legislation. We have repeatedly come together to advance an important bill on a bipartisan basis. and We continue to share the goal of seeing this legislation become law. That is why it is disappointing that, according to news reports, this hearing has not really been called to serve as a forum for building greater support for the bill, as the title of the hearing might suggest. Instead, it appears that its true purpose is to provide a forum to discuss allegations that Chairman Jordan has made surrounding the termination of one of our witnesses by a news organization and to advance a false narrative about media bias. I am sympathetic to anyone who's been abruptly laid off from the job, and I understand the resentment that someone can feel against their former employer. In fact, CBS laid off 800 people, one of whom happened to be a close personal friend of mine. But even if any allegations of so-called political bias made today are true, and to be clear, I have no reason to believe that they are, Congress is not the proper forum for these personal grievances to be aired or resolved. As we listen to the testimony today, we should remember that news media organizations have their own First Amendment rights, which include the right to exercise editorial judgment about what does and does not get reported as news. News media organizations also ultimately speak or act through their employees and agents. Barring some other, un some other unlawful reason for termination, uh -huh like race or sex discrimination, Congress does not have the authority to meddle in the relationship between reporters and their employing news organizations, especially if it is in to intervene in a purported conflict over what story to investigate or not to investigate. To do so would, in my view, run afoul of the First Amendment. Indeed, some might even say that this very hearing is an example of the government jawboning the news media over its coverage or lack of coverage of a particular subject and an improper intrusion into the affairs of the press. If the history of overwhelming bipartisan support for the Press Act is, indication, is any indication, I would hope that we have universal agreement on the dais that the government should respect the independence of the free press, and that we should continue our work to protect journalists from being compelled to reveal their sources. That is where our focus should properly lay. We should be jawboning the real barrier to achieving important protection for press freedom. The United States Senate, which for the fourth time is sitting on a reporter on a federal reporter's is sitting on federal reporter's shield legislation that the House passed in an overwhelmingly bipartisan fashion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the ranking member for his opening statement. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witnesses. Ms. Catherine Herridge. Ms. Herridge is an award-winning journalist who most recently served as a senior investigative correspondent for CBS News from 2019 to 2024. Previously, she served as the chief intelligence correspondent for Fox News from 1996 to 2019. Ms. Mary Cavallaro. Ms. Cavallaro is the chief broadcast officer for the news and broadcast department at SAG-AFTRA, a position she has held since 2010. Ms. Cavallaro is responsible for seeing, overseeing the negotiation and administration of over 250 
labor agreements with network and local broadcast employers nationwide. Ms. Cheryl Atkinson. Ms. Atkinson is a five-time Emmy Award-winning journalist and a recipient of the Edward R. Murrow Award for Investigative Reporting. She has been a journalist for 30 years and is currently the managing editor and host of Full Measure. Ms. Nadine Farid Johnson. Ms. Farid Johnson is the policy director of the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. She previously worked at Penn America, the State Department, and in private practice as a patent litigator. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please rise and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. Ms. Herridge, you may begin. Good morning, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, Chairman Roy, and Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of the subcommittee. I'm here today with a deep sense of gratitude and humility. I appreciate the subcommittee taking the time to focus again on the importance of protecting reporter sources and the vital safeguards provided by the Press Act. As you know, in February, I was held in contempt of court for refusing to disclose my confidential sources on a national security story. I think my current situation can help put the importance of the Press Act into context. One of our children recently asked me if I would go to jail, if we would lose our house, and if we would lose our family savings to protect my reporting sources. I wanted to answer that in this United States where we say we value democracy and the role of a vibrant and free press, that it was impossible, but I could not offer that assurance. The Bipartisan Press Act, which came out of this House committee, would put an end to the sort of legal jeopardy that I have experienced firsthand in the federal courts. And without the legislation, more journalists will run the uncertainty of the contempt gauntlet in the future. This legislation will provide protections for every working journalist in the United States, now and for the next generation. The legislation provides strong protections at the federal level for reporters and their sources. It would block litigants and federal government from prying into a reporter's files, except when there's an imminent threat of violence, including terrorism and in defamation cases. At the state level, similar rules are already in place to protect press freedom. It is my sincere hope that the passage of the Press Act will provide similar protections at the federal level. I hope that I am the last journalist who has to spend two years in the federal courts fighting to protect my confidential sources. My current situation arises from a Privacy Act lawsuit. I am only a witness in the case. It is not common for these cases to reach the stage of holding a reporter in contempt but when such cases happen, they have profound consequences, impacting every journalist in the United States. Forcing a reporter to disclose confidential sources would have a crippling effect on investigative journalism, because without reliable assurances of confidentiality, sources will not come forward. The First Amendment provides protections for the press because an informed electorate is at the foundation of our democracy. If confidential forces are not protected, I fear investigative journalism is dead. Each day, I feel the weight of that responsibility. As you know, I was held in contempt of court for upholding the basic journalistic principle of maintaining the pledge of confidentiality to my sources. I have complete respect for the federal court and the judicial process, and I'm not here lit to litigate the case. It will play out before the appellate court in Washington, D.C. But the fact that I have been fighting in the courts for two years and that I am now facing potentially crippling fines of $800 a day to protect my reporting sources underscores the vital importance of the Press Act. When you go through major life events, as I have in recent weeks, losing your job, losing your company health insurance, having your reporting files seized by your former employer, and being held in contempt of court gives you clarity. 
the First Amendment, the protection of confidential sources, and a free press are my guiding principles. They are my North Star. When I was laid off in February, an incident reinforced in my mind the importance of protecting confidential sources. CBS News locked me out of the building and seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. Multiple sources said they were concerned that by working with me to expose government corruption and misconduct, they would be identified and exposed. I pushed back, and with the public support of my union, SAG-AFTRA, the records were returned. CBS's News's decision to receive my reporting records crossed a red line that I believe should never be crossed again by any media organization in the future. The litigation and being held in contempt have taken a toll on me and my career. This is not a battle you can fight alone. I am grateful for the support of fellow journalists and multiple First Amendment organizations, including the Reporters Committee for Press Freedom, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, the Coalition for Women in Journalism, the Knight First Amendment Institute, the Society of Professional Journalists, as well as the Columbia Journalism School, of which I am a graduate. I have also been fortunate to have the support from my former employer as I continue to fight this case. Not many journalists could count on a former employer, in this case Fox News, to support a costly and vigorous defense of the First Amendment. That is why the Press Act comes at the right time when independent journalism and news platforms are expanding opportunities for reporting diverse voices that strengthen our democracy. I know I join many journalists who are encouraged by the recent comments of the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer who said he hopes to have the legislation through the Senate and on the President's desk this year. I deeply appreciate the committee's commitment to this legislation and holding this public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Herridge. Ms. Cavallaro, you may begin. Good morning. Thank you, Committee Chairman Jordan, Subcommittee Chairman Roy, Committee Ranking Member Nadler, Subcommittee Ranking Member Scanlon, and distinguished members of this subcommittee for this opportunity to testify on fighting for a free press, protecting journalists and their sources. My name is Mary Caballero. I serve as the Chief Broadcast Officer for SAG-AFTRA, a national union of over 160,000 members that represents professionals in the entertainment and media industries. I am responsible for overseeing the union's collective bargaining agreements with our news and broadcast employers across the country. I was invited here today for the purpose of providing testimony in support of the most basic of First Amendment principles, protecting journalists from being compelled to reveal their sources and the critical nature of the confidential source relationship. Government intrusion upon the relationship between a reporter and their sources undermines the foundation of the freedom of press. A free press is essential to our democracy. To quote Walter Cronkite, a longtime SAG-AFTRA member, freedom of the press is not just important to democracy, it is democracy. While SAG-AFTRA's core responsibility is to negotiate, administer, and enforce the collective bargaining agreements under which our members work, the union is also charged with advocating on behalf of our members for legislation that directly impacts their work and their profession. SAG-AFTRA's legislative work has recently focused on artificial intelligence, protecting an intellectual property, and restricting non-compete clauses in employment contracts, all of which are important, important initiatives. And for decades, the union has enthusiastically supported the passage of a federal reporter shield law. We thank the House Judiciary Committee for its leadership on this issue. And it's bipartisan, unanimous passage of the Press Act at the committee level. We also thank the entire United States House of Representatives for its unanimous passage of this vital legislation in January of 2024. And call upon the United States Senate to expeditiously, expeditiously pass this legislation and send it to President Biden for signature. If signed into law, the Press Act would establish the first federal press shield law in United States history and will significantly strengthen press freedom by safeguarding journalists and their confidential sources. 
The Press Act creates a federal statutory privilege to shield journalists from being compelled to reveal their confidential sources and prevents federal law enforcement agencies from abusing subpoena power to access journalists' email and phone records. This long overdue legislation represents a significant leap forward, not just for journalists, but for the sanctity of journalism itself and for the constitutional right to freedom of the press. SAG-AFTRA stands in solidarity with journalists, their employers, and press advocacy groups who share the common goal of a federal shield law for journalists. The Press Act is bipartisan legislation that guarantees and protects our most basic of First Amendment principles, the freedom of the press to disseminate information to the public free from government interference of any kind is essential to our democracy. Protecting a journalist's relationship with a source is critical to allowing stories to be told and essential to holding our elected officials and others to account for their actions. The press is America's watchdog responsible for serving the public interest by working to uncover and investigate government and corporate abuse, overreach, and malfeasance. Any form of government control over journalists could chill the instinct of a potential source to come forward and tell their stories to journalists, depriving the American people of critical information and the ability to hold those in power publicly accountable. Recent events and ongoing litigation involving journalists and their employers and their shared concern for protecting sources have created some renewed interest and energy around this issue. SAG-AFTRA is hopeful that this interest and energy will be used in a, a productive and nonpartisan way to move the Press Act forward. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak before the subcommittee today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Cavallaro. Ms. Atkinson, you may begin. Good morning, it's an honor to be here and also to get to meet Catherine, finally. In decades of reporting nationally at CNN, CBS, PBS, and for the last nine years on my TV show, Full Measure, countless news stories that I broke or facets of them could not have been reported without sources whose identities needed to be protected. To name just a few, Enron, BP oil spill, TARP bank bailout, follow the money investigations on taxpayer spending, congressional oversight, congressional fundraising, prescription drug and vaccine dangers, Haiti earthquake aid, K Street lobbying, green energy failures, waste and fraud at the Red Cross, Firestone tires, Benghazi, and Fast and Furious. The last 12 stories I mentioned thanks to some information provided by sources who could not be quoted by name, received recognition from the Emmy Awards. Multiply that by thousands of reporters and countless stories, and it's fair to argue that a lot of important facts would never have been exposed if journalists couldn't ensure protection of our sensitive sources' identities. Today's managed information landscape makes it more difficult for journalists and our sources to report on ethical lapses, wrongdoing, and crimes. More often than not, the truth teller, when named, is smeared and ruined while the wrongdoers carry on. They escape accountability and may even get promoted. They've seen what's happened to Assange and Snowden, their earth-shattering revelations quickly eclipsed by organized efforts to distract by controversializing them. So it makes sense to ask, what's the impact if we can no longer assure our sources that we can protect their identities? It's not a new concern. Years ago, after adverse court decisions started coming down on this front, I was at CBS and we began having to consider whether a confidential source in a story would be okay with ultimately having his identity revealed if a judge ordered it. Obviously, the answer was often no. I could no longer provide assurances to a whistleblower who feared for his career or safety that I could guarantee protection of his identity. Some stories still got done, but many became non-starters. There's no way to quantify with any certainty what we've lost, but I don't think there are many investigative reporters who would say it's not having an impact. There are ideas to help, such as the Press Act, that would generally bar federal agencies from forcing telecommunications firms to turn over records belonging to journalists. But it's important to note that some of the most egregious intrusions on press freedoms don't happen that way. Our intelligence agencies have been working, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> this is important, I need to clear my throat. <laughs> Our intelligence agencies have been working hand-in-hand -hand with telecommunications firms for decades, 
with billions of dollars in dark contracts and secretive arrangements. They don't need to ask for permission to access journalist records or those of Congress or regular citizens. Current efforts to reauthorize Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act relate to this. There's a lengthy record of government surveillance abuses to be found in just the little we've been able to learn about. Intelligence officials have misled Congress about surveilling U.S. citizens, even spying on journalists and political figures, their staff, and allies. It's been a known problem for decades. An Inspector General report in 2020 found the FBI violated Woods procedure safeguards in every single wiretap audited. <clears throat> Pardon me. In just 29 FISA applications reviewed, there were 409 errors. Even when caught and pressed, the FBI only had fessed up to half of them. It was all brushed off as innocent mistakes and poor training as usual. It's been 11 years since CBS News officially announced that I was targeted by unauthorized intrusions into my work computer. Subsequent forensics unearthed government-controlled IP addresses used in the intrusions and proved that not only did the guilty parties monitor my work in real time, they also accessed my fast and furious files, got into the larger CBS system, planted classified documents deep in my operating system, and were able to listen in on conversations by activating Skype audio. I sued after it was clear the Department of Justice would not hold its own accountable. The case is the first we know of in which a journalist spied on by the government received a clerk's default against an agent working for government parties in a surveillance operation. It's a small victory because he was soon reported dead, which means we can't access potential information leading to the larger players. Besides that, I've learned that wrongdoers in the federal government have their own shield laws that protect them from accountability. Making sure journalists can protect their sources and do the constitutionally protected job that we do is critical, but new laws won't necessarily impact dishonest players in government who have proven more than capable of and willing to skirt laws to access the information they want. Thank you, Ms. Ackerson. Ms. Free Johnson, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, Chairman Roy, and Ranking Member Scanlon, and members of the subcommittee for convening today's hearing. It is an honor and a privilege to present this testimony. The mission of the Knight Institute, where I serve as policy director, is to defend the freedoms of speech and the press in the digital age. Our work is concentrated on the intersection of First Amendment freedoms and new technology and dedicated to protecting and promoting a system of free expression that serves contemporary democracies. Our press freedom projects, like all our work, focus on fortifying the infrastructure of First Amendment law and values to meet 21st century pressures. For journalists and media organizations, those pressures are formidable. They stem from surveillance tools in both government and private hands that create new vulnerabilities for reporters, powerful government and private entities that are fiercely resistant to public oversight and accountability, and the capacity of machines to generate and disseminate news and news-like creations. The Institute is a leading voice for the First Amendment rights of journalists and news organizations to publish vital information in the public interest. Our aim is to strengthen the constitutional and statutory protections that will minimize threats and ensure that journalists and news organizations can carry out their vital work. No single piece of legislation is as strongly correlated with these efforts as the bipartisan Protect Reporter from, from Exploitative State Spying, or PRESS Act, introduced in this Congress by Representative Kylie of the subcommittee, co led by Rep Representative Raskin, and passed in the House. Modern news gathering requires that reporters are able to give assurances of confidentiality to their sources. Testimonial protections for journalists are essential to core First Amendment values. Yet Supreme Court jurisprudence on the protection of journalist source materials is ambiguous. In its 1972 seminal case on the topic, Bransburg v. Hayes, the court note acknowledged that news gathering is not without First Amendment protections, but did not delineate what those protections might be. The murkiness of the Brandsburg decision has led to confusion about its holding and inconsistency in its application. Illustrating this is the patchwork of federal circuit court tests that has emerged in the 52 years since the court's decision. The differences in approach result in unpredictability and inconsistency and ultimately compromise the ability of journalists to do the work we need them to do. Without strong First Amendment protections, journalists are less likely to be able to engage confidential sources as fewer of them will come forward. And when that flow of information stops, it means the American public is less informed. Despite widespread shield laws and court-recognized reporters' privileges across the states, the precarious landscape at the federal level remains, meaning congressional action is urgently needed. 
For these reasons, the Knight Institute fully supports the Bipartisan Press Act. It is critical to a free press, protecting journalists from state-sanctioned surveillance and reaffirming their First Amendment rights. Passing the Press Act is also important because of the changing nature of what it means to be a journalist today. We know that in the digital age, a significant amount of important reporting is done by journalists who do not fit a traditional mold. Whether writing for the Washington Post or offering a subscription on Substack, journalists should be afforded a clear, consistent, predictable protection from policies that account for a range of legitimate and valuable journalistic activities. Clarifying who qualifies for protection via a federal shield bill is critical to preventing misguided attempts by the government to compel journalists and media outlets to reveal source information in contravention of their First Amendment rights. It would also ensure durability across administrations, leading to less uncertainty for journalists and media outlets across the country. The Press Act addresses this issue, offering definitions that account for the broad landscape of journalism today, better protecting an appropriately wide swath of reporters and reporting activity. The Act also commendably protects journalist communications, ensuring that inf information held by third-party phone and internet providers is not secretly seized by the government. These provisions are critical to protecting journalists' First Amendment rights. There are, of course, situations in which competing interests will be at play in the determination of whether compelling the disclosure of information gained in the course of an investigation or other journalistic act is warranted. The Press Act appropriately addresses these concerns as well with a series of exceptions. In sum, Passage of the Press Act into law would provide critical support to the free press, thereby benefiting all Americans. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Free Johnson. We will now proceed with questions under the five-minute rule, and uh, the chair will recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've seen a growing number of increasingly aggressive acts by the federal government and its agencies to suppress debate in many different forums. Uh, the IRS intimidation of, of Tea Party activists through its abuse of its authority, uh, the use of intelligence and, and law enforcement agencies to suppress vital information, such as the contents of the Hunter Biden uh, laptop or dissenting views on COVID, uh, all that turned out to be uh, factual and correct. You know, the beating heart of a uh, democracy is, is, is freedom of speech. That's the right of every citizen to express their opinions freely. Um, it's by this discussion um, that we have the tools to, to sort out uh, fact from fiction or uh, wisdom from folly or right from wrong. That's how a free society finds its way. And a free press is absolutely fundamental to that process. Without it, the, the, the people cannot make informed decisions or, or hold their government accountable for its actions. And uh, human nature being what it is, we all know that the most closely guarded secrets of the government are not those that are marked top secret, it's those that are marked embarrassing. And it's precisely those uh, embarrassing facts that are most important for the public to know. Now, I agree with the ranking members that, uh, that CBS has the right to shape its own coverage, no matter how biased it might be. But when the government pressures any news outlet, or for that matter, any private party, to suppress or shape its coverage, that crosses a very bright and dangerous line. So, Ms. Herridge, uh, do you know if CBS's actions were, were influenced by the government in any way? Use your mic. Pardon me. Pardon me. Um, uh, Congressman, I'm not uh, someone who's known to offer speculation, so I, I can't really answer that question directly. Okay, fair enough. Um, but with the, all of the uh, travail that you've been dragged through by the government, has anybody been within the government been held accountable uh, uh, for, for, these, uh, for these acts against you and your freedom? Congressman, based on my experience, I feel that we're in a very dangerous place as journalists. I'm facing crippling fines, up to $800 a day for protecting my confidential sources. I'm fortunate that that has been stayed pending the appeal. Who's responsible for that, though? I mean, who are the actors within the government that are waging war against the, the, the freedom of, of individual journalists like yourself uh, to, uh, uh, to, to report the facts that the American people need to form their own opinions. If you're referring uh, to my particular case, I want to be respectful of the ongoing litigation. It's in front of the uh, appellate court. I want to emphasize that I'm only a witness in well, that case. Let me ask you this. Has anybody been held accountable for, 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 the, for these acts against you? Uh, no. 
Okay, Ms. Atkinson, what's your, what's your uh, experience? Well, I think it's interesting to hear people say, and I agree with this, that the government should not be intervening in news coverage, but in my experience at CBS, that happens every day. Members of committees, so. heads of committees, members of Congress and the White House call the Bureau in Washington, D.C., contacts that they have, uh, editors and managers up in New York to try to shape our coverage. Well, that, 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 that I don't find particularly objectionable, as, as, as long as there is no uh, force or threat of force behind that. Do, do you find that to be the case? Or, I don't know or, what or was said. There? I just know they called. There was no, no physical force threatened, but there certainly is a great deal of pressure, you know, weighing on the networks in terms of their coverage. Well, uh, uh, what about uh, uh, government acts directly? Uh, <laughs> have you encountered such intimidation yourself directly from the government, or is that all, all kind of channeled through your employers? Well, I felt a great deal of pressure channeled through my employers. You know, we, I was told that certain stories weren't gonna air because we were getting phone calls, and even though there was nothing wrong with the stories, let's just let it rest for a day, let's pick it up another time, they're really mad this time, and there was no objection over the content of the story or the facts. It was they just, as I was told, they just didn't like it, or it was a story that they felt was unfavorable at times. Well, I mean, if they, if they were if they were offering uh, additional facts that might have been ignored, if they were offering different opinions, uh, that, that's freedom of speech. But if behind those suggestions was the the threat of force, that's a completely different matter. Do, do you agree? Well, yeah, my position was when political officials call into the newsroom, there should be a policy where we tell them if they object to something or have a factual uh, issue that they should put it in writing and send it in. But there are these extensive conversations that go on behind the scenes. I only know about a few of them, um, a relative few of them. I'm sure they happen in other scenarios as well. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from California. I will now recognize the ranking member uh, for any uh, questions he might have under the five-minute rule. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Atkinson, <clears throat> the question of FISA aside, and you know that FISA's renewal is currently controversially before the, before the Congress, should I read your testimony or hear your testimony to say that the PRESS Act would not be sufficient? In my view, to handle some of the problems we've discussed, I'm not saying it shouldn't be passed, and I'm not an expert no, on what it is. but it's not sufficient. Yeah, I think that won't handle, you know. What else should we do? Well, I think it's a global problem that has to do with sending a message to, a message of oversight to the intelligence agencies that we know have for decades violated rights and, and po made policies that are contrary to Constitution and so on. I don't think there has been an effort they think is serious. I feel like the intelligence agencies feel like they're running the committees here rather than the committees conducting oversight of them, and that there needs to be something they understand that they would be held accountable when they do things. And I don't know what that looks like in practice, but I don't think the law is in the Thank you. Ms. Johnson, in the Brandsburg case, the Supreme Court declined to recognize the First Amendment privilege for news gatherers. What is the source of Congress authority to provide such a privilege by statute? Congress is absolutely authorized under the Constitution to provide this privilege to, to, to create legislation and promulgate legislation under stat, by statute to ensure that these rights are enshrined further into law. And in fact, my understanding is that in Brandsburg, the court invited Congress to do so. Um, so we are really pleased that the House has acted in this regard, and we look forward to the Senate doing so as well. Ms. Johnson, according to your written testimony, the decades since the Supreme Court decided Brandsburg, Many federal circuit courts have recognized some form of a qualified reporter's privilege. In that case, why is it still important that we step in to author a statutory reporter's privilege like the Press Act? That's, that's right, sir. Exactly. It's because the law is unsettled. You have different landscape all across the country where different circuit courts have different interpretations of Brandsburg. And actually, there is a decision at one point where a circuit court judge said that the, the Brandsburg case is something like as clear as mud, right? It really has not... Um, allowed for a clear understanding of that landscape. With congressional action, the Press Act would reduce chill on sources, it would help journalists do the work we need them to do because it would provide clarity in that landscape that is now muddled and uncertain. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, as we have heard, Ms. Herridge is currently subject to a civil contempt order by a federal judge in Washington, D.C., in a case where she has refused to provide testimony regarding her confidential sources that may be relevant to the private litigants case against the government. 
It so happens that the government defendants accused of wrongdoing in that case include the FBI. If the Press Act were law, would it have, a, would it have applied to Ms. Harrington in her current circumstances? And, it is, and is it important that reporters who may be a third party to litigation brought by a party other than the government also receive protection for their First Amendment interests? I do believe that the Press Act, had it been enacted at the time of litigation, would have, would have played a role in this, because the most important thing that the Press Act does is that it forecloses the government from compelling journalist disclosure of their sources. And yes, I do believe it is important for, for there to be this protection for journalists across the board. So you believe it would protect, it would stop the litigation against Ms. Herridge? I believe vis-a-vis -vis the compelling of sources, it would, have, it would have played a role, yes. Thank you, I yield back. I uh, thank the ranking member. I will now recognize the gentlelady from Wyoming for uh, questions uh, under the five-minute rule. Good morning, ladies, and thank you for being here to address such an incredibly important issue. Ms. Harridge, I'd like to start with you. About two months ago, you were held in contempt and levied daily fines of $800 per day for your refusal to disclose your sources. This is deeply concerning, and what's more concerning, you are not the first in an, in an article related to your case, the Washington Post reported how in 2005, five national reporters were held in contempt and levied fines of $500 per day. And in 2008, a USA Today reporter was held in contempt and faced daily fines of $5,000. All of these instances where reporters upheld their journalistic integrity and protected their sources to ensure good reporting for the American people only to face rebuke and heavy-handed enforcement by the courts, which are intended to protect the First Amendment. Ms. Harridge, how fundamental to reporting is the protection of your sources? Congresswoman, I have not lost a night's sleep about my decision to protect my confidential sources. That is the core of who I am as a journalist. I am facing contempt fines because I am upholding the most basic principle of journalism. If you cannot offer a source a promise of confidentiality as a journalist, your toolbox is empty. No whistleblower is coming forward, no government official with evidence of misconduct or corruption. And what that means is that it interrupts the free flow of information to the public, and as we all recognized, Journalism is about an informed electorate, which is the bedrock of our democracy. If you had asked me 37 years ago when I started working that I would be in the federal courts living a legal nightmare to protect my sources, I would never have believed it. I told you a story about my son. I'd like to finish it. At the end of the conversation, he said, Mom, you do what it takes. I've got your back. And I thought if a teenager understands how sacred this pledge is for every journalist, certainly Congress can pass the Press Act and codify these guarantees that will prevent cases like mine in the future. Thank you for that. Um, do you think that the heavy-handed nature of these fines is to compel quick disclosure of sources and not give reporters a choice, that, a, this, a similar choice the way that you've exercised yours? Congressman, just ask yourself. How many journalists can withstand fines, in my case, of $800 a day? Mm -hmm. Mine's being stayed pending the appeal. In another case you cited, it was $5,000 a day. These fines are designed that you have to disclose your sources. You have to burn them. And in a marketplace where we have this explosion in independent journalism and smaller outfits, they cannot withstand these fines. They cannot mount a costly and vigorous legal defense of the First Amendment. That is why I think this is such a dangerous time and why the Press Act can codify these guarantees and it can happen with a very strong, in fact, the strongest bipartisan message about the importance of the freedom of the press. Well, it, it doesn't just apply in your industry. We have other agencies and I think that it's a sign of a tyrannical government when we give them the ability to, to levy fines like this. And, and an example that I was, will use is that the EPA has the authority to levy fines of $59,000 a day. And they do so, and that's how they will force people into settlements and consent decrees, even if they are not necessarily guilty. But they cannot withstand the pressure that they, ha that they bring to bear when you have a government that has that kind of authority. 
So I think that it applies in the First Amendment context with our journalists, but I think it's a bigger issue that we as Congress need to address across the board because, again, I will use the word, it, it results in tyranny when you give agencies or officials that kind of authority. One thing that has been mentioned is that 32 states in Washington, D.C. have shield laws. However, not all states do, and there is no federal shield law, as each of you have described. As seen in your case and the case of others, this has then re resulted in the courts actually being enlisted to compel disclosure of your resources, of your sources. In instances such as your case, what does a hostile court system do for the protection of a free press? I think it presents another very significant challenge for journalism. As my colleague Cheryl Atkinson said, when you are working with a whistleblower or you're working with a government source who has access to real information, and what I mean is information that is so important to get to the public so they can make up their own minds, especially about controversial issues. If you can't offer that assurance, nobody's playing ball with you. And as a journalist, you are always asking yourself, I think, in the marketplace where we are today, what kind of assurances can I provide? Can I go to the mat for this person? I've always believed that I'm willing to go to the mat. I think I've shown that in this mm -hmm. contempt case. But not everyone is going to be able to have that opportunity. Well, I thank you. I thank you for your bravery. I thank you for what you've been willing to expose. And I thank you all for willing to, being willing to stand up to the tyranny that we're seeing and the attack on the First Amendment. It is critical for the freedom of every single person in this room. So thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank the gentlelady from Wyoming. I will now recognize the gentlelady from Vermont, Ms. Ballant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the things that I've noticed um, in this committee and in, in my subcommittees is that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle often overpromise and underdeliver, And we are told repeatedly that there are conspiracy theories, we have a, a, a government that is going after uh, individual and private citizens. I mean, this is the narrative over and over and over again. And, you know, as a, as a new one to this committee, I'm, I'm always so disappointed when I feel like there's, there's actually a lot that we agree on. And press freedoms and the Press Act is something that we were able to all come together on. And that's where our, our attention should be. We should always be making sure that we have a, a free and protected press. Now, what I'm hearing is, is really about employment disputes with news agencies that are now being conflated into some kind of conspiracy theory, uh, once again, of the government going after, uh, in this case, not just private individuals, but, but the press. And personal grievances, witnesses' personal grievances, um, are not actually attacks on the First Amendment and the free press. And from what I've heard from uh, this hearing so far and the materials that we were given in preparation of this, it, it seems pretty clear to the, me that most of the allegations that have been made so far involve disputes over what are essentially employment and editorial decision making by private news organizations in the context of, of news gathering, public reporting, which we all you know, desperately need in this country. And as I said, we came together to support the Press Act. We all agree that it's an important piece of legislation to protect. I wish we spent more time in this committee really talking about important issues and not once again having the colleagues overpromise and underdeliver. If I believed every single time of the conspiracy theories that are pulled before this committee, I would have to believe that there was a boogeyman behind every corner, under every rock. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And it prevents us 
from doing the real work that we need to do to protect a free press, which we desperately need. Now, Ms. Fareed Johnson, could you explain to us um, what is jawboning? Can you explain that to us? Yes, jawboning is the act of coercion by the government to an entity to get it to, uh, well, in, in, in the case we've seen so far, um, to get it to change its positioning, programming, what have you, in terms of what it presents to the public. Do you have concerns about congressional hearings such as this one, um, or statements that, that office holders make that could be intended to influ influence editorial decisions at news organizations? News organizations are entitled to decide for themselves what subjects to cover, and the First Amendment protects the editorial decisions they make about their news coverage. It would be unconstitutional for any government official to attempt to coerce a news organization through legal threats or exercise of the state's coercive power. And, and could jawboning be considered unconstitutional? Well, as you know, we, we filed a, an amicus brief um, in the Murthy case that is before the Supreme Court. Um, and what we talked about there is that we have said publicly, actually, that the government has an important role to play mm -hmm. as a participant in public discourse, including trying to persuade, for example, social media platforms to change their policies, but not to engage in coercion to do so. There is a line there, and we believe that line, that line is critically important. And Ms. Free Johnson, what does it mean for free public discourse if public officials can informally intimidate or influence editorial decision making such as in a, a hearing such as this one? The critical thing is, is that it cannot be coercion. We want to ensure that the First Amendment protections that are afforded to news organizations, for example, are maintained. And so that would mean that there cannot be that that level of influence cannot go to in, in, into coercion. But again, of course, we believe that the government has an important role to play in terms of public discourse. Thank you so much, Ms. Fury Johnson. I really appreciate your time. I yield back. Thank the gentlelady from Vermont. Uh, we're gonna do one more round of questions before we uh, break the Prime Minister. So I'm gonna recognize the uh, gentleman from North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think people go into investigative reporting to get rich. Uh, I think it's an incredibly important service that was just pointed, but uh, I just want to react a little bit. I don't think being held in contempt, either civilly or criminally, is either A, a conspiracy theory, or B, part of, a, part of an employment dispute. You're either going to be civilly held in contempt and fined until you disclose your source, or worse yet, you're going to be put in an 8 by 10 with bars on the window. That's what contempt means, for not disclosing a source. So if there's been more chilling effect on uh, the right of the free pass and right for North Dakota citizens to be, to be informed about what's going on, I'd like to know it. I mean, Ms. Harrod, you've been held in contempt. Do you feel like that's part of an employment dispute? I want to have complete respect for the legal process. My case is, is being litigated. But no, these are separate matters, Congressman. You know, I'm hopeful soon that the Senate will take up the Press Act and add a federal shield law for reporters being compelled to reveal confidential sources. Ms. Atkinson, I am under the impression that reporters in most states have shield law protection, but federal judges and courts are not bound by the same laws. I'm terribly sorry I'm not familiar with the status of the states versus... Well, I know in North Dakota we have a shield law, and in a lot of different states they do. So, In 2011, you reported on the Obama... And, and, I want to back up just a sec. We act like this is new stuff, but this has been going on for a long time. I mean, we've had a lot of talks about DOJ and Twitter and Section 230 and liability and immunity and all of those things. But in 2011, you reported on the Obama administration's Operation Fast and Furious operation, in which ATF purposely allowed licensed firearm dealers to sell weapons to illegal straw bars. Were confidential sources and, important and, and information critical to informing the pub public about that scandal? Yes. Would you have been able to shed light on the federal government selling weapons, including grenade launchers and anti-aircraft weapons, to the Mexican drug cartels without guaranteeing confidentiality of your sources? It would have been tough. There would have been some something to report, but not 
what we ended up reporting. <clears throat> and when you were reporting on the security lapses in the 2012 Benghazi embassy attack, do you think you would have been able to shed light on the federal government's failure to maintain embassy security without guaranteeing confidentiality or sources? Some of it, yes, but some of it, no. Do you, like me, believe it's important for the American people to be informed of these things, as long, along with waste, fraud, and abuse by the federal government, and we should do what we can to ensure robust media scrutiny of those government officials? Yes. Even if that includes members of Congress? Right. <laughs> Does the status quo where sources need to depend on a reporter and their outlet's financial tolerance or physical tolerance for contempt punishment is a, 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 equate to a functional, sensible system? No, and, and one quick example, a lot of times a source will end up going on the record, which is preferable, mm -hmm. but you can't begin the conversation many times if you can't start out by telling him as you begin to talk that he's not going to be identified yet. Does the current system have a chilling effect on potential confidential sources and whistleblowers? Yes. If we pass the Press Act, you talked a little bit about the Press Act and uh, where you think it's deficient and whatever, but you agree it would be helpful at least. It seems like it would be helpful. You know, I just in the last minute and 30 seconds, I think we can deal with this. I think there's certain things that we have to recognize. I'm a former criminal def defense attorney. Uh, confidentiality with my clients is absolutely essential in order to deal with those things. And I think there's there are a lot of different similarities, but you have to be as mentally tough as anybody to be an investigative reporter. And we're sitting here right now talking about these things. At the same time, we got a letter from the DOJ saying that they can't release an audio tape after they've already given us the transcript from a computer where it was, where it was tried to be erased but only found later because it would have a chilling effect on potential witnesses coming forward to talk about a crime. That's what the letter said. And at the same time, we have a DOJ going to investigative reporters saying, I know you guaranteed these people confidentiality to report against their government doing something bad against the U.S. citizens, but I am going to force you to expose that or I'm going to hold you in civil contempt, criminal contempt, or all of those things. Does that seem a little bit hypocritical to you, Ms. Atkinson? There are many things that seem to be double standard-ish, one way for them and another way for us. I mean, they, they're literally saying we can't, reduce, we can't release something because otherwise we won't ever be able to investigate anything again, which, by the way, is patently false, but also at the same time when they don't like something any of you all are writing, right, left, center, conservative, liberal, they say, I want to know who your source is. I get it. I do too, and I think it's very, very unfortunate. And with that, I yield back. I now recognize my colleague from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Uh, Chairman Roy, I'm very grateful for your courtesies and the courtesies of this committee, to the ranking member, uh, the courtesies of Ms. Scanlon. Um, the good news that, that I heard as we were uh, concluding your last question, Ms. Atkinson, is that the Press Act does help. Um, it I seems like it would, Ms. Lee. Yes, and so we need to, um, the word investigative, I hope that you want us as members of Congress to investigate so we get it right. Um, so that this uh, very uh, hallowed uh, amendment or Bill of Rights uh, and the First Amendment is taken seriously. I take it very seriously, and I appreciate the work that all of you do um, in spite of the obstacles that you face. Uh, this is America, and we have mountains and valleys. Uh, I would like to get a sense from uh, all of you um, where, the, where we are in the comfort level of your protection. I'm gonna start with Johnson. I appreciate the Institute at uh, Columbia, I believe. Um, and I, I want to make sure we've got the Press Act that may be um, uh, needing to be reimagined. Um, we're looking at other legislation that allows investigative reporters to work, but not, I think there's a fine line between, um, I, I wanna use the term abuse on both sides, but there's a fine line. So I'm gonna start with you, Ms. Johnson. What more care do we need to give uh, to uh, have the work of an investigative reporter work? And I'm gonna ask each of you that question. Um, I think that will help us, I'll, I'll be finished and I'll have to get another hearing at another point to go into more deeply concerned issues. But Ms. Uh, Johnson, if you would quickly. So I think the first thing that we need to do is to ensure the press act, press act gets passed into law and signed. But I think it's also important to remember and to recognize this is a fraught time for journalists. We have new surveillance technologies. We have a question of funding for journalism itself. 
And so it's really important to do what Congress can do in the immediate term to protect information that is vital to our democracy, which is to protect journalists and allow them to do the job we need them to do. And are you concluding your testimony by saying that would be to pass the Press Act and have funding? I, the first thing Congress should do, yes, is to pass is to pass the Press Act, ensure that it is signed into law in order to protect journalists and allow them to be able to give assurances to their sources that they will not be revealed. And there is, of course, a bigger question about, about funding for journalism as a profession as a whole. Yes, All right. Let me, Ms. Atkinson, what do we, where do we need to go with this? One outstanding issue is regardless of what laws are passed, we know from the factual record that there are bad actors inside our agencies that will violate laws. So a law doesn't necessarily provide full protection. And number two, when a citizen tries to get redress for something like that in civil courts as I'm doing, I found the federal government has inordinate protections, their own shield laws, I'll call them. They have immunity, they have, we have to get permission from them, the alleged guilty party, to get depositions and information. And I think this is something that needs to be fixed by Congress, the, the broad immunity granted to people who may be doing wrong inside government. Um, and is there any uh, detriment to the IE, um, the, uh, I'm on another, uh, <laughs> on the AI, um, is there another detriment to the fact that AI exists amongst us? I'll bet there is, but I'm not an expert on that. All right. Um, we were back-to-back -back hearings. Uh, and if you would, Ms. Um, Cavalcade, Cavallaro, sorry, didn't see it. Thank you, Ms. Cavallaro. What sure. more do we need to do? So I, I sag aftra has for decades supported a federal shield law. And we would first hope that the Press Act passes. I think that's a priority. I think we need to take that first step I do think there are other challenges facing uh, journalism and journalists that we would love to use our voice as a labor union representing journalists to advocate for, but I do think that it's a priority. I think the idea that this passed uh, unanimously and there is bipartisan support should mean it's something that we should be able to move forward quickly and expeditiously. We're going to do a deep dive on that. I want to just quickly uh, finish, I think, with Ms. Um, Atkinson. Herridge. Thank, yeah, Herridge. Um, I'm looking at Ms. Herridge. Yes, thank you. If you, you would. For, sure, thank you for the question. I, I agree with my colleagues. I think the imperative is, is to get the Press Act through the Senate and on the President's desk. It's going to close a gap in the federal courts. It's going to bring consistency between the state shield and the federal shield laws. And I just think a lot of good follow, will follow from that. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very grateful for the time given. I think. Uh, we are committed to doing a deep dive on this very important issue. First Amendment rights are pivotal, and I want to be part of helping as opposed to undermining. Thank you so very much, uh, and I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Texas. I'll now recognize the, uh, rank, uh, the chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Atkinson, you wrote stories critical of the Obama administration. Is that accurate? Yes, but may I point out it wasn't put in a political light, and there were also stories no. that some would consider critical of the Bush administration. We'll say it this way. You wrote stories critical of the government. Yes. Yeah. And you, you, you factually reported. And then uh, you did on Fast and Furious, you did on Benghazi and other issues. Yes. Uh, and, and even before, as you said, on the Bush administration. Um, and then strange things started happening to you, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, like your computer, you think it, your phone gets bugged, you believe, and things happen to your computer after you wrote stories critical of the government. Right. That's scary, right? Yeah, it's, it's not, not frightening everybody. feeling, right. Ms. Harridge, you wrote stories critical of the Biden administration. Is that, is that true? That's fair. I mean, you wrote a number of things about the, the laptop issue, about Hunter Biden, all kinds of things. You wrote critical of the, the Biden family, the Biden business operation, the Biden brand, and all that stuff. Congressman, I reported out the facts of the story. You sure I, did. I you sure did. You reported the facts. And uh, then CBS fired you. Is that right? Uh, my position was terminated. Yeah, and you're an award-winning journalist. How, how long did you work at CBS? Uh, I worked at CBS News uh, for four and a half years. Uh, during that period, uh, we won major awards. Uh, we, I was part of an Emmy-winning team. I was nominated for investigative Emmys. Um, I think the most important projects were projects that drove legislation here on the Hill that positively impacted 
a million veterans. So award-winning journalists won all, won all kinds of awards, had worked there almost five years, had extensive experience at a different major network prior to that where you were also an award-winning journalist, done all kinds of reporting critical of the government there as well, and then you get fired. But it's worse than that, isn't it? Because they didn't just fire you. What else did they do? On February 13th, when I was told on a Zoom call that my employment was terminated, I was locked out of my emails and I was locked out of the office. Um, CBS News seized hundreds of pages of my reporting files, including confidential source information. And that's not normal, is it? No, that's not my experience in the other two networks that I've worked at or with my colleagues um, at CBS News. When the network of Walter Cronkite seizes your reporting files, including confidential source information, that is an attack on investigative journalism. Yes, it, sh it sure is. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to, it seems to me there's a pattern developing here. You're critical of the government, Miss Atkinson situation, and shazam, they, just, they start doing all kinds of strange things to your phone line, to your computer. You're critical of the government at a major news organization, and you're award-winning journalist. You've been there five years, you get fired. But it's not just you got fired. In fact, you can, we can, we can, maybe there's nothing to that. But what we do know is they seize your documents. That's scary as well. And you talk about a chilling effect on the First Amendment, I don't know how it could be more chilling. Now, thank goodness the lady sitting beside you, they stepped in, right? Because they're stepping in and helping. Them stepping in help you get your, because you got your files back finally, didn't you? I did get the files back. Uh, if I didn't have the support of SAG-AFTRA really publicly standing up for journalism, I don't believe that I would have re received the files and they would have been returned, and I just want to be clear, Congressman, wherever you work, if this happened to you, it's an attack on free press, it's an attack on the First Amendment, it makes it more challenging for reporters to work in the future. That disrupts the free flow of information to the public. They call it a journalism, a profession for a reason, because it's about an informed electorate, and it's a cornerstone of our democracy. I can only speak for myself. When my records were seized, I felt it was a journalistic rape. Uh, Ms. Cavallaro, have you ever seen that before, where when, when someone is uh, leaving an employment at a, at a major news organization, they seize their documents? I can't say that SAG-AFTRA is familiar with every single case of termination or departure where- I'm not asking that. I'm saying, have you ever seen anything like this? I have, I have no recollection of seeing- Well, that should scare us too. First time it ever happened, and it happens to an award-winning journalist who's been in this profession for a number of years, known all across the profession. And that happens on the heels of what happened to Ms. Atkinson because both journalists were critical of the government. That's exactly what the, that's what journalism is about, being critical of the government when the government's doing things wrong, and then to have a major news organization or the government itself do this. In your testimony, Ms. Herridge, you had a, a very important line. You said, if confidential sources are not protected, Journalism is dead, and I agree, but it would seem to me if retaliation is allowed by the government or by some major media outlet, journalism is dead as well. And that's what this hearing's about. And I, again, want to thank you all for, for coming and sharing your important testimony. I yield back. I, I thank the chairman. Uh, I'd like to recognize the ranking member. I just have a unanimous consent request to enter into the record Paramount's response to Chairman Jordan's February 23rd letter regarding Ms. Harridge's termination. It corrects the record on some of the wild speculation and mischaracterization we've heard from the other side as it describes that but, Ms. Harridge was not the only person who was uh, let go at that time and that certain procedures were followed. The chairman, the chairman, you have just for a second? Uh, the gentleman from Ohio. I, I didn't. I didn't. All I said is it happened, but what happened afterwards is what's scary when they seized your files. That is scary, because that is, that is, that is the point I tried unanimous to consent right. to introduce the letter. Without objection. Thank you. Suspend for one second. So, do you want to go ahead and do, just proceed? Okay, fine. It's not kosher. It's not kosher. not objecting to that. Uh, I will not recognize the ranking member for okay. questions. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our witnesses here today. I appreciate Ms. Harridge's repeated acknowledgement that her employment dispute is separate from the civil lawsuit in which she was held in contempt for refusing to disclose a confidential source. 
um, despite the apparent confusion of some of my colleagues where they conflated those two matters. Um, it's clear, I think, that the contempt was the result of a private individual's lawsuit seeking that in information. It wasn't a government action seeking that information until it got to the point where the courts were um, enforcing a contempt um, citation. Which brings us back to my remarks at the outset, which is that with the federal law in a state of muddiness, confusion, disarray since the um, Brandsburg versus Hayes decision over 50 years ago, um, it really is incumbent upon Congress to take action to make sure that the courts are not put in a position where they are exerting fines or possible jail time against journalists because they don't think they have the authority not to. Um, so in Brandsburg, the court explicitly invited Congress to, quote, determine whether a statutory newsman, I would say, and women's privilege is necessary and desirable and to fashion standards and rules as narrow or broad as deemed necessary. So, uh, Ms. Johnson, if you could just take us through why should Congress step in and actually take up this invitation, particularly in the context of the recent threats to the First Amendment and free freedom of the press in our modern world? Congress should absolutely take this up because it is, in fact, confusing. And it leaves journalists in alert where they are going to be subject to, or have been subject to, different interpretations of this seminal case that, as you note, is over 50 years old. But with the Press Act and with the definitions it provides and with the, and with the comprehension with which it addresses this issue, it is really a, an opportunity for Congress to clarify and to offer that certainty to journalists and to offer certainty to sources who, as we've heard from our colleagues on the, on, on the stand here today, are going to be less and less likely to come forward. And that ultimately harms Americans because when Americans do not have access to information, they cannot um, understand what their government is doing. So it really is, it is, a, it is a comprehensive approach that, that needs to happen as quickly as possible. And, and I appreciate that. I think it also harms our court system when we're putting our courts in the position where, they're, where they are doing something that is then undermining First Amendment and, and free press rights. Um, we've noted, I think, that dozens of our states, I, I've seen 49 states, I've seen 32 states, so the majority of states in D.C. have now enacted shield laws, but they are not uniform. Um, and of course, we have the federal circuit courts, which have a variety of interpretations of what's required or not required. How does that impact um, journalism in, in this modern age where so much of it is digital and online platforms, and we're not talking about the mom and pop paper down the street anymore, but we're talking about wider distribution sources? How does the lack of a more uniform shield law impact journalism? It impacts it in a few ways, and I will say that the 49, 49 states plus Washington have either a, a shield law or a court recognition of a reporter's okay. privilege. So there's, there's the, the distinction there. But actually, I think it's important to bring this down to an example, because the DOJ recently put into place media guidelines that talk about what a member of the news media um, can or cannot be subject to in terms of the limitations as to what the government can do to, to compel sources. However, the Justice Department's internal criteria give the agency substantial latitude when it comes to defining what a member of the news media is. And as I noted in my testimony, in this digital age, we have a number of individuals who are engaging in legitimate journalistic acts who might not fit a traditional mold in terms of being, for example, a Wall Street Journal reporter. Mm -hmm. But it is important that we recognize that because we are now in an age of, of new technologies and new opportunities and innovations in journalism, that having the Press Act with this broad definition to protect journalists of all different types of stripes will be important to ensuring that assurance for journalists across the board. Well, again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for helping us reemphasize the importance of the Press Act and hopefully uh, persuading our senatorial colleagues to get with it and help us get this done. So thank you again. I yield back. I thank the ranking member. I want to thank uh, her and my Democrat colleagues for working with us to try to move this along. I believe we're going to be able to finish the hearing without uh, breaking. Uh, the Prime Minister has not yet started speaking. So we're going to proceed, and then we hopefully won't have to break and come back for everybody's benefit. Uh, so, uh, Ms. Harridge, could you just quickly, for the benefit of the committee, um, articulate the awards and uh, honors you received in carrying out your, uh, you know, uh, profession? Wow, that's a little embarrassing. But oh, it's important. I've always tried to stay in the background. Um, I'm so proud of the work that we did at CBS News. 
I was part of an Emmy winning team. I was also nominated for investigative Emmys primarily for the work that we did uh, revealing the toxic exposure of our veterans, specifically a group uh, who were based in Uzbekistan in K2. This was a launching off pad for classified operations uh, into Afghanistan. We also did reporting that was a catalyst for legislation, the Camp Lejeune Justice Act, which has opened new opportunities and benefits and payments for a million veterans and civilians. This was real impact reporting, and it was accountability reporting on uh, both the left and the right. And you mentioned uh, Emmys, uh, other awards. In other words, uh, is there any indication of, um, you know, uh, negative conduct in carrying out your, your, your profession, right? I mean, you've been, you've been getting awards. Uh, nothing would indicate that there was a failure to perform your duties, failure to do your job competently, correct? Congressman, I think what you're asking me is whether I was terminated for poor performance. I don't believe that my record would reflect that. I don't know what factors the CBS News executives considered when they terminated my position. There was tension over the Hunter Biden reporting and the Biden administration, but I can't say for sure why I was let go. And you mentioned that tension. Uh, you had been one of the, the reporters, certainly in what we might de define as the mainstream media, that was focusing intently on the uh, uh, Hunter Biden laptop, on the uh, various uh, facts surrounding the Biden family and the flow of money and all of the things involved with that. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, for the full picture, though, I was also the reporter at CBS News who obtained the audio tape of former President Trump mm -hmm. apparently bragging about the Iran classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, and I also exposed how 50 soldiers were denied the Purple Heart under the Trump administration in an effort to de-escalate after a ballistic missile attack in Iran. I, I'm someone who calls balls and strikes congressman. I just follow the facts where they lead. That has always been my calling card. And when CBS let you go, was it around the time of you calling out the Trump administration or around the time that you were pursuing more of the Hunter Biden? Uh, I was let go a few days after the special counsel Robert Hur report uh, into President Biden's handling of classified information. Um, at the same time all that's going on, you're managing the issue with Fox and the uh, reality that you are being held in contempt, and you've touched on it, and I don't want to uh, repeat it too much, but it's really important that, uh, for the record, you are in fact being held in contempt by a court at the tune of $800 a day, which as you've noticed and thankfully been stayed pending appeal. That is correct? That is correct. And I'd also like to emphasize, Congressman, that I have total respect for the legal process. My case is in front of the appellate court, mm -hmm. and so it's, I'm limited in what I can say. I reject characterizations that the court is being heavy-handed. It's well within their discretion uh, to levy these fines. I was making the point that for many journalists, facing fines of that significance would be insurmountable, and they'd have to make a hard choice about whether to protect their sources. In closing, could you just um, reiterate the extent uh, of your belief of what this means for, for other journalists, and you alluded to before, um, smaller journalists without the protection of the bubble of the kind of corporate structure that you've got with uh, Fox uh, backing you up from your previous reporting? I just don't think many journalists could withstand the threat of significant and crippling financial sanctions. They may not have a former employer or a current employer who's in a position to mount a vigorous and costly defense. I think it's a very dangerous period for journalism. The Press Act would close the legal gap in the system, this ambiguity that I've had to deal with for two years. And I wanna emphasize, this is not about a single journalist, it's not about a single story, it's not about a single network. What happens in my case, the passage of the Press Act is gonna impact every journalism work, journalist working in this room, and it's gonna impact every journalist in the United States and for the next generation to come. If there's anything I can accomplish in my career as a journalist, it's going to be getting this over the finish line. I feel this with every core of my being. Thank you, Ms. Harridge. I do want to acknowledge that the gentleman from North Carolina has been waiting here patiently throughout the hearing. He indicated he didn't necessarily have a lot of questions, but I do want to give him a moment here at close before we uh, adjourn.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I will take advantage of the opportunity. I think you guys have aired the Press Act, which of course has already passed here very well, its purpose um, in grant creating a limited privilege in the, in the, on, on the part of journalists. Uh, I appreciate the fact, uh, I've certainly heard Ms. Atkinson and Ms. Heritage from you. I understand and I appreciate your ethic in terms of maintaining your position of calling balls and strikes, your, your uh, desire and your professional per commitment to maintaining a neutrality so that you're on guard even to coming here and letting Republicans take shots at CBS News through you, Ms. Heritage, for example. I get, I get that. But there is another, there's another thing here, and I think about uh, the presence of Matt Taibbi and, and Michael Schellenberger, uh, a lot of the independence of journalists. Ms. Heritage, I mean, nevertheless, my observation, and, and, I, and I'm a Republican, so it's partisan, I guess, in part, but, but my, I think, I, you look at the stats, I would suggest the American people see it this way. CBS News is among the corporate behemoth media outlets all of which seem to be captured by one side of the American political spectrum. You've worked for one of those. Uh, maybe Fox News is one, on, is, a, is one on the other side, but CBS, NBC, Wall Street Journal, uh, excuse me, well, largely, yes, Washington Post, um, uh, New York Times, uh, all of big media seems to be captured by one side. You've worked for a sustained period of time for one of those networks. Um, what, what of that? I mean, is that not true? It's not so much about your firing, your termination, whether it's because of Hunter Biden's story or whatever, but isn't that a problem? And how does a journalist who's independent and wants to call balls and strikes function in an environment where all the big media behemoths are captured by one side of the political spectrum? Congressman, I've always tried to be respectful of my former employers. So I worked at ABC News, I worked at Fox News, and I worked at CBS News, and I brought the same approach at every place that I worked, which is that it's about accountability journalism on the left and on the right and representing diverse points of view. This is so important in a marketplace of ideas. It's so important in a civil debate to settle issues in this country. And I feel that the Press Act in guaranteeing these protections to sources helps grow the voices in journalism. That's the bottom line for me. Okay, I, 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 I get that. And I understand that you may wanna limit uh, the avenues you or the areas you wanna take on so that you can emphasize those things that might make cover new ground. And the Press Act is where you decided to focus. But I, I'll give you one more opportunity. To the extent you're one of the admirable professional journalists who call balls and strikes, it, when you sit on, you're on air at CBS News, you're lending your ethic in your image to an organization that's decided to do something decidedly different. Is that not true? Sir, I came to CBS News to do investigative reporting and to bring in diverse voices, and I did my best to do that. I can't explain all of the decisions of the executives, in some cases, I felt that they limited points of view and voices. I was uncomfortable with that because I think good journalism is about diverse voices. I think uh, professional ethical journalists, and Ms. Atkinson, I haven't wanted to leave you out, but I, uh, you know, it's hard to pick one example and kind of go there. I, I, I have great respect for the struggles that your profession uh, has. And, but, um, and I don't know how all of them get solved. I do believe it makes, we make progress in uh, bits and pieces. Uh, but I, I also, um, I do think that, that uh, it, it is a, a great tragedy that um, uh, big media uh, have all, uh, you know, they, they can trot out a Catherine Herridge, uh, but uh, everyone, I think, probably recognizes who's fair-minded where the overall trend has gone and that it leaves professional journalists in a hopelessly conflicted situation. Uh, if you have a network uh, that that is decided to go one way entirely, and uh, and merely has a, a tokenism as to what professional journalism ought to be, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from North Carolina. I, that this concludes today's hearing. We thank the witnesses for appearing before the committee today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned.